So one of my carryover goals from last year was to take more notes while I'm reading. My recommitment to that goal could not have come at a better time because I just, I can't imagine what the interior of my thoughts would have looked like while reading To Paradise. I can only imagine that it would look like that famous scene from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia where Charlie is just like connecting the dots like a, like a madman. And I say that because with To Paradise, there are a lot of threads hanging around and it feels like most of the time there's nowhere to really attach them. The book is split into three sections. One is in 1893, one is in 1993, one is in 2093. Each of these timelines has an Edward, a Charles, a David, some Peters. The similarities even go past the names. Two of the books feature Hawaii very significantly. The same townhouse in Washington Square features very prominently in all three stories and kind of serves as the anchor for the story. Two of the three stories have very prominent, powerful grandfathers whose machinations are really affecting the lives of their grandchildren. All three of these books end with the exact same phrase and the exact same image, someone kind of reaching out to their future optimistically hoping that where they're going is to paradise. But what is the point of all the Davids and Charleses and Edwards and Peters? Even, even the butlers all have the same name. This is where I think some readers are misinterpreting what I think the goal of the book is. I think because there's these three timelines, because you have names that repeat over and over again, because you're in the same locations, it is so easy to make this book into a puzzle you need to figure out. What are the connections? What does it all mean? Things that are happening in, in 1893, how are they tethered to what's going on in 2093? It's so easy to get bogged down in that, and I think that is part of the fun of the novel. But I think that part of the novel is a lot more subtle than people are going to want it to be, because I don't really think that is the point. And this is where I really wish Yonagahara, her publishers, whoever, had chosen to name the book something else. Let's say, this is a terrible title, but something like, What If? That would have directed their readers towards, I think, where Yonagahara wanted to go. What this story does, what this book does, is encourage its readers to ask, what if this happened? What if that happened? How would things be different on a grand scale and on a, on a more intimate scale if all these little things had been different? What if after the Civil War in America, things like race and class remained problems, but sexuality, homosexuality, didn't? What if Hawaii had declared independence? How differently would things be there? What if we had a drastically different response to the pandemic or the idea of pandemics. And those what if questions that the novel asks you explicitly, but also the questions that I think Yanagahara is just encouraging you to ask after you finish reading, that's the most interesting part of the book. That's the part that I think I'm gonna take with me now that it's over. And then in the kind of broad scheme of things, like what things would have had to change in the past for today to be any different? Or if you wanna flip it, what huge things could have happened in the past that ultimately would have led us to this exact same spot? I think asking these big what if questions when the novel is over is part of the fun of the novel and that's the thing that's gonna stay with me. But also while you're reading the book, each of these stories is very much peppered with what if questions. I think the, the what if nature of the book is the kind of propulsive narrative. In book one, what if David's grandfather had let him in on what he was doing or his thoughts on his relationship with Edward much earlier in the story. Would things have turned out differently? Would things have turned out any differently for David in book two if he'd just been honest about his past? In book three, would things be different for Charlie if she had told Edward that she loved him? In each of these books, in each of these stories, there's these big, grander societal what-if questions. But but yeah, in each of these stories, there's, there's constantly this, this, this thought that I think Yanagahara is trying to put into your head. How would this have turned out differently if this little thing had changed, if this little thing had changed, if this person had acted in this different way? So what I think Yanagahara was trying to do with a story like this, what I hope readers are doing 
after they finish the book is start to ask themselves, what little decisions am I making that are going to have very large, very broad consequences in my life and probably other people's lives. And what's funny about this is that I, it, it, that's either like really philosophically interesting to think about, or I think if you're a certain type of person, that's just going to lead to just massive anxiety. There's a certain fatalism into paradise that I'm still kind of grappling with. It definitely seems to make an argument that despite some of these changes, big and small, humanity, society, just people in general, you know, we're likely to maybe even get to some of these same places regardless of, of what the past is. There's just a natural movement of things. And I, and I read in a, a review a couple of days ago about this book that talked about energy and how energy moves and how energy is not necessarily just destroyed. It just, it changes, it transfers. And I thought that was such an interesting way to look at this story because if you change the past, if you change some of the history of America, it, not, it doesn't necessarily get rid of that energy that was there, it just transfers it and moves it around and eventually that energy is gonna come back where it was supposed to go anyway. But the tricky thing about that is that while that's fascinating to think about or like that intellectual exercise is interesting, it's really sad. There are definitely times reading this book when I thought like, what does all of this matter? What is the point of trying so hard and ripping your heart out and trying to rebuild something if, if it's all gonna go to the same place anyway? That's not necessarily what the book is saying all the time or that that's ultimately what the book is trying to tell you, but there's, there's definitely moments throughout the story where that is, that's how it feels. I think book one is the most interesting of all three. I think book one holds your attention the most. I think the alternate history that is discussed in book one is the most interesting. And that's the one that I was most sad when it ended. Book two, I didn't really care about at all. Book three spiked my interest again, but not quite as much as book one. I think the alternate history in book one where after the civil war, instead of America kind of uniting as this giant country again, it splits off into four pieces. You have the colonies in the South, which is very much just kind of where conservatives would live. You have the free states in the Northeast, and that's very much where, you know, the Democrats would live. You have the West Coast, which is kind of the frontier. Then you have like the Midwest to kind of, you know, Northern America today, which is what the United States are. And it's retelling of history where even the idea that race and class were still these uncomfortable levers that society would be yanking on all the time, they were still massive problems, was something that was interesting in the, in the conceit of this world. The fact that African Americans in this world were probably tolerated a little more than they were at that time, but also they weren't allowed to even live in the free states. They were given free reign to pass through the free states, but they weren't allowed to live there or own property there. These tweaks at history are really, really interesting and I think fun to play with. And I would love to see where she was going with them or what she thought the effects of these things would be, but I didn't think that they played out much in the other stories. Again, it just, it felt like it was going to a place you already recognize. And I kind of just wish that the whole book was just the rest of book one. And when I say the rest of book one, I think that's an important point because my, I think my biggest problem with the book is that all three stories feel fragmentary. They all feel unfinished to some degree. When book one ended, I was like kind of upset because I wanted to see where it was gonna go. When book two ended, I was kind of happy because I was very much done with that story that was, that was the least interesting to me. When book three ended, I think I normally would have wanted to see more out of that story, but after 720 pages of the entire novel, I was ready for it to be over. Also the future in book three, book three was just unrelentingly dark and sad and grim. And if all three books, maybe maybe they're not narratively unfinished, but I feel like they're emotionally unfinished for the reader. So maybe she's, t she's taking some of that torture that she had in a little life that she was just like throwing on Jude over and over and over again. She's taking some of that torturous feeling and now putting it on the reader this time and just getting you emotionally invested in each of these stories and then just pulling the rug out from under you and letting you know like, guess what? You're not gonna find out how this ends. I feel like some readers, that's gonna drive them 
bananas. It didn't make me all that mad, but I think in saying that, that's almost a criticism because I think I'm able to say that because my connection to each of these characters isn't particularly strong. It's stronger, I think, in book one, and then it just gets less in book two. And in book three, it perks up again, but again, by the time the book is over, you're just you're just ready for it to be over. This is such a big, weighty book that I, at least for me, when I when I read 700 pages of a book, I'm just ready for it to be done. And by the time you're at the end of this book, you understand the cyclical nature of her storytelling, and I think you know you're not going to get the ending that maybe you wanted. I saw Yanagahara talking. With, it must have been a quote from the. I think it might have been in the Guardian review of the book or the, the coverage of the book, talking about why she named all the characters the same. There's Edwards in every story, there's David's in every story, there's Charles's in every story. Why she did that, and there was something, there, I, I, I am too lazy to find the quote, but basically she's saying that there's a, there's a power in taking away the names of some, or changing the names of things over time. There's a power in that. People are like staking claim to things when they change names, and that keeping the names similar throughout the story with different people was just kind of making the statement about how we use names, what they're for, what they signify, how we feel about them. And hearing her talk about it sounds interesting. And I, 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 I give her the freedom to try to explore that. I just don't think she nailed it here, like at all. Like this is just not the place to talk about that because putting the same names on all these characters in each of these stories, one, like part of the reason I'm not talking about much about the specifics of each book is that it sounds insane if I keep saying the same characters but in different combinations and, and one David is different than another David and Charles in this one is old and Charles in this one is even older. And this it's, it gets so hard to follow in a conversation and it's even really hard to follow when you're when you're reading it. It just became something that weighed the novel down because it's just, as a reader, it's hard to engage with that. And also it doesn't even get her point across and that's the frustrating part of it. Like what she was trying to do with the, the, the reissue of all these names, I don't think it comes across at all. I think it's the worst aspect of the novel because I think it's really distracting. And I think any of the downsides of this novel are the things that distract you from what I think the novel's trying to do. You know what, now that I say it, I said, I said that book one was the most interesting of the three and it's the one I wanted to follow the most after it was done, but I think Book three might have been my favorite, might have been the one I was genuinely most interested in. I think book one has a little bit of a boost of being the first book. So it's when you first read this and you're excited to tackle to paradise and it's the first story you encounter. So there's like a, a rush, there's a, there's a life to that that can't be duplicated in book two or book three. So I think it does get a bit of a boost that way. And book three naturally gets pulled down a little bit because it's at the end of the book and you're, you're tired. But I think the storyline of book three, the characters in book three, the interplay of the characters in book three, the, the, the letters that the majority of that story is told through are quite interesting. Dealing with the pandemics is quite interesting. Those questions of, of what if, what if someone had done something differently? Would these pandemics, would this reality have changed? I think it has maybe my favorite character in the book, Charles Griffith. I think he's the most interesting person in the book. He's the engineer of some of the, the awful things that are happening in the society, but he's also this really loving father. And to see the dichotomy of his personality play out is really, really interesting. He might be the only person in the book that really explores like, you know, the positive and negative sides of a personality or a person or of a life. So what is the book about? Other than these what if questions that I think play a big role in determining, you know, what the book is and how you feel about the book. What do I think the book is actually saying? I think ultimately what To Paradise is saying is that the concept of paradise is kind of stupid or at least very unrealistic. It's delusional and I think potentially dangerous for people who really, really believe in it. And I think the question a lot of people are asking is how do you feel about the book in comparison to A Little Life? I think To Paradise is both better and worse than A Little Life in very different ways. I think A Little Life, what was great about A Little Life and what was awful about A Little Life was that it, it operated under these extremes. The highs of that book were so high 
And the lows of that book were so low for me. That is a book I didn't necessarily enjoy reading. I really, really appreciated that book afterward. I really appreciated how it made me feel or what it allowed me to take away from it. That's why I loved A Little Life. I did not love reading A Little Life. It was, I mean, as you know, it was an extremely painful experience and I didn't necessarily enjoy the reading of it. To Paradise is almost the inversion of that. I enjoyed reading this book. For the most part, I was pretty invested in this book. I was very, very happy that this book did not have the emotional, physical torture of reading A Little Life. I haven't read People in the Trees, but I, I from what I've heard, that is a, an excruciating book as well at some points. So I'm glad Yanagahara did go in a different direction with this book. I think she's taking her readers somewhere they didn't expect to go. That is really gonna bother some readers, which I've seen. Some people have not taken to this book and then some people really enjoy Yanagahara taking them somewhere else. I was one of those people. I did not want to relive anything about A Little Life. I was not interested in having a book that felt the same, that talked about some of the same things, that left me asking the same questions. I, I already had A Little Life for that. I didn't want that again. So To Paradise was a more enjoyable book to read. So ultimately what that means is that the floor for To Paradise, for me, is higher than the floor for A Little Life. But the highs of Two Paradise are not nearly as high as A Little Life. So with A Little Life, you have a book that kind of exists on these two extremes here, and Two Paradise for me exists kind of more here. It's hard to compare book to book, experience to experience. Uh, a Little Life is obviously going to affect me more long term than Two Paradise did. But at the same time, what's similar about these two books is that I think my reaction after the book was over was more interesting to me than my reactions to the book while it was happening. Both books did that for me. After A Little Life, I was very focused on just the emotional damage that had been done to me or, or empathizing with the emotional and physical damage that had been done to other people and just kind of taking that in and wrestling with that and, and feeling like you've been changed as a person as a result of experiencing someone else's life who had gone through those things. With To Paradise, it's these these what if questions, this, this, this more broader look at society, more a broader, maybe more interesting, more philosophical look at history, the consequences of our actions, how things change with just these tiny little tweaks to your life. That stuff is really fun for me. I really enjoy when books make me think after they're over, even if what I'm thinking about was not the book itself. And I don't think I'm going to be thinking much about To Paradise, specifically the plot points, the characters, what happened, but it's going to have an effect on me just as a human being. So now that I come to the end of this, what I'm gathering about Yonagahara is that you can only experience her for yourself. Your opinion of this book, of any one of her books could be just drastically different from someone that you really align with. I have a somewhat famous review of, of A Little Life here in our little corner of booktube. And I don't think people who agreed with me in that video are necessarily going to agree with me in this video. If we both loved A Little Life, I don't necessarily think that we will both feel the same about To Paradise. And for me, how do I feel about To Paradise? I would say I would I would rate To Paradise somewhere between a seven and an eight out of 10. I would probably split the difference and say 7.5. I certainly don't think it is as miserable as some people seem to claim that it is, but it's also not a book that's gonna knock your socks off. I think what you're gonna get out of this book really depends on how you are going into it. I will admit I was, I was biased towards liking this book. I wanted to like this book. I also had heard about it from a lot of people before I started reading it. So I had a certain expectation that it was going to be different. It was going to feel different. And I had made peace with that before I started. That's my one piece of advice. If you decide to read this book, take it on its own merit. It's not A Little Life 2. It is another book from Yanagahara and she is allowed to do different things than A Little Life. If you want this to feel the same or sound the same or bring out some of the same things in you that A Little Life did, 
this is the wrong book for you. It's not going to do that. That's not what it's trying to do. So there you go. Those are my 13 thoughts on To Paradise by Hanya Yanagihara. Thank you so much for sticking around with me. My name is Rick McDonnell, and I will see you all in a couple days. Bye.